time with them in the area and show off your your wonderful city. And it's also, uh, as dean, the Every easiest time, yeah, day that I can have. So I sat up here and talked about my research rather than having to solve administrative problems. I I much prefer these. These are these are fun. The um, the my co-author on this paper is uh, D. Went. Yes, we're aware. Um, my my co-author is Dee Wynn. She just graduated from uh, Clemson University with her PhD, and so she's taking a job at University College in Dublin, uh, starting in a few weeks. So um, this was. Let's see, let me get rid of this over here. When, when, when preparing for this, I, I don't know your different backgrounds. I know that you're familiar with optimization, and so this is, uh, so I, I don't worry so much about that, but I don't know what you've seen on network interdiction. So I thought I would start with a little bit about what interdiction is, which was great. I got a chance to practice this this morning because my, you know, my daughter, who's up here with me, said, so what is your talk about? Which is a really brave thing to ask me because it's a captive audience, and we had another two hours together. I'm like, okay, you asked. But the way I said it was, you know, you are, you're at work, you're trying to get home, uh, or you're at work and you're trying to deliver pizzas, that's what she does as a teenager, and so if you're trying to deliver pizzas and you say uh, that you're looking for a shortest path, which roads could be closed in a way that would cause you, a very smart individual, to get to your destination, um, to, takes it as long as possible for you to get to your destination. So it's a max men game. I act first to close some roads, and then she would act next to drive to her location. But she's very smart, so she'll still be solving a shortest path problem over here. So these are these Stackelberg games where it's a two-player game. One person, and they, and they take turns, as opposed to simultaneous play games. And so the idea is that uh, the leader goes first, the follower goes second, with full information of what the leader, uh, what the leader does. And um, I've said shortest path, and I'm going to talk about shortest path today, but it can really be anything. It can be uh, maximum flow problems, it can be any really linear program, it can even be nonlinear programs, whatever you want to uh, think about in this, in this context. So I used to live uh, in Florida, and this would be a, 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 um, an example of interdiction. We have those creatures in Florida. I think it's too cold in Montreal for alligators. That's a good thing. Um, so, but the, the idea is for network interdiction is that if I'm the leader uh, or this alligator, I'm going to lengthen your travel times by blocking roads in order to try to maximize your minimum objective. So. Um, to think about what this might be, it's really helpful to use a couple of examples in particular. And uh, most of what I'll talk about here, it's just, um, it's, it's a nice thing mathematically if I do it this way. If I just say, rather than destroying a road, I lengthen the road. There's a technical and a non-technical reason that that makes it easier. The technical reason is that if you destroy the arc with most of the mathematical programming-based network interdiction formulations that you'd use, you end up having some nonlinearities that you have to linearize a little bit later. It's not a big deal, but it's just a little bit more clumsy when you're giving a presentation and when you're trying to present this some, any other way. Um, the practical reason for this is that you have a road network. If a network, if a road is blocked, it doesn't literally mean that I can't get from point A to point B. What it really means is that you're gonna to have to go drive around it sometime. I mean, we had this on our drive here. There was a big truck. It tried to make a right turn. It hit a utility pole, and I have not seen this before, but the utility pole started swaying, and the power lines above us were swaying a bit, and I, I was not driving, but I said, Katie, why don't you leave that way? So, is that the best way to go? I'm like, anything other than where we are right now is the best place to be. So there are, there's always a detour. And that way you don't have to model all of the other tiny little roads that would be a part of the network. You could just say lengthening the travel time means you found a different way around it. So my base cost is going to be C. And don't worry if you don't remember all this. That's okay. But my base cost, the normal operator, the normal travel time will be the CIJs over arc IJ, and the delay will be D. So you can remember the D is, is for delay. So an interdicted cost is the base cost plus the delay. All right. Yeah. But this problem is not equivalent to uh, removing the arc completely. Can we always say that you can model this problem using this? Uh, problem formulation, the problem where you remove the arc completely. Sure. So then the question was for, for, for people that are listening to this online, so um, is this, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but is this somewhat limiting, meaning yes, but can you actually represent the case where you destroy the arc completely? And the answer is yes. What you do is you end up giving it a big M cost for, for the D, and you say, well, 
is that kind of cheating a little bit. Not really because most of the, uh, when you do the linearization, uh, if you were to do a destroy the arc and you have that nonlinear, you end up having a product of a continuous variable and a binary variable, and then you have to use some sort of big M. It's the same big M. So what you end up using is saying, I can look at the other paths in the network and I can make that cost so large that you would never want to use it. So the answer is yes, but it's clumsy. But it's, the good news is it's not more clumsy than just the other. You know, the normal, normal Very nice question. I am making a relatively um, simple assumption over here to say that whoever's doing the interdicting is going to have a budget of how many arcs they're allowed to interdict. It can be more general than that. It's, there's no problem by saying that it's a, like a, like a, I'm saying a cardinality budget. No more, I can remove no more than four arcs. Uh, but you could always make that some sort of knapsack type of constraint if you want. The, the modeling for our purposes doesn't change here. That's not always true. But in, for what we're doing today, it doesn't much change. But that's not always true. Okay, so if I want to therefore go through and try to model this problem, this is, the, this is like interdiction 101, what I would do is I would have my x variables being the, um, the, the which are, the variables are attacked, or which arcs, sorry, which arcs are attacked, and the y variables being the flow. And you'll see this a little bit better the way we've got it over here. So my constraints, I think most of you are looking over this way. I will give one third attention to that screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, Right over here, uh, these, these constraints are just your normal flow balance constraints, and you can see that they don't depend on x, because I'm going to allow you to use the arcs no matter what. It's just that you'll do so at an increased travel time if they're attacked. So what you're seeing up here in the objective function is that if you, if you set yij equal to 1, you're going to get a cost of cij, the base cost, unless that arc was attacked, in which, which means xij is equal to 1, in which case you're going to pick up that extra dij cost. Okay, so um, to solve the problem, there's really two different ways of going about doing this. All right. One is to, and which was the way that I started doing this in my career, was to take the inner problem, if it's a linear program or if it's a convex optimization problem, and simply dualize that problem. And now instead of the um, awkward max-min formulation, you end up with a max-max formulation. So the idea is that you have the dual variables associated with, the, um, with these uh, flow balance constraints. Um, I didn't define a flow balance constraint for the sync node because that's linearly dependent upon the other constraints, so I don't need that. But just it's, it's easier to go ahead and include it here and just say define it equal to zero. And you actually end up with a very intuitive type of constraint. I, I think it's intuitive. What you're saying is the pi's the, flow, the duals on the flow balance constraints, if I define pi t to be zero, then the pi's take on the interpretation of the shortest path cost to get from node i. So pi i would be the shortest path cost from node i to the end. So if you know that, then it's the same thing as the shortest path, what they would normally be. So then if I got an arc i j, the distance from i to j can't be more than the arc length itself. And so that's the same kind of interpretation you would have in, in a shortest path dual to begin with. And the arc length the CIJ if I didn't, uh, it was CIJ no matter what, plus DIJ if it had been interdicted. And so therefore you come out with a very, um, you know, very straightforward type of model. So, so the combining these models over here, I want to maximize as the interdictor, I want to maximize the length of that path. So that's pi s, remembering that pi s is the shortest path distance from the source node to the end. But I have rules. I can't force your distance from i to j to be longer than the actual length of the arc itself. And that's what the duals are telling you over here. What are, what are my other rules? Don't spend too much on interdiction and make sure that I'm not interdicting half an arc. And that's, that's all there is to it. Okay. There's a different way of doing this, and this is, uh, again, kind of at my, at my interdiction 101, but I would say this is maybe interdiction 102, is that there's a different way of modeling these. And it took me, uh, as a researcher, a little bit of time to warm to this because my background is in integer programming. So I'd much rather deal with a compact formulation, meaning a polynomial number of variables and constraints, and look for facets and look for cutting planes and try to lift these. And I mean, that you see a smile on my face already. I love doing that kind of stuff. Here's the, 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 the problem. 
that it's it's slow. It's just slow. There's there's nothing else I can say about it. And um, it took a while, but there is a very unappealing way of solving the problem that is so much faster than the way that I really wanted to solve it. You do this by Bender's decomposition. It's not literally Bender's decomposition all the time, although it is in this in this case. But you simply take a, var a variable z and you decide, okay, I want to maximize z. So z is going to be the length of the path, of the follower's path. And then the rule is z can't be more than the actual cost of every path. So you enumerate every possible path and you say z is equal to the minimum cost of a path. Well, that's a nonlinear constraint, so you simply maximize z subject to z is less than or equal to the cost of all of those paths. So, I mean, you know where I'm going with this. If I say that for every path p, a of p is the set of arcs, I can get a, and you'll understand what I'm doing over here now, you'll get a formulation that says, what's the cost of path p? Well, I just sum up the arc lengths in every path. And the arc lengths in every path, again, it's C if I don't interdict it, it's C plus D if I do interdict it. Of course, that's an awful formulation because there's an exponential number of paths. But of course, what you do is you include a few paths to begin with, and then you just, uh, within the branch inbound tree, you don't solve it all the way to optimality, but within the branch inbound tree, as soon as you get an integer node, uh, you test to see if there are any paths that should have been added. That's actually very fast. You're just solving a shortest path problem because X is fixed at that point. So you're just solving a shortest path problem. So then you dynamically add these rows as you go. And you say, well, is that faster within this branch and cut process than solving the problem, the formulation that I showed you before? Sadly, the answer is that it is not just faster, it is much faster. And the reason why is that if I have a problem that has 100 arcs, Probably the other formulation, the combined formulation is, is better. But if I've got a problem that has millions of arcs, and we've, we've done this for very large road networks, if you've got millions of arcs, then the previous formulation is simultaneously considering a what if for every arc in that network. To formulate the problem, you have to enumerate so many, of, uh, so many constraints, like flow balance constraints, for all of these different nodes. So if you've got a uh, half million nodes, you're gonna have a half million constraints. Think about the way that you drive, if you, if you do drive, think about the way you would drive to work. There's a lot of streets in Montreal. I've only been here 24 hours. I don't know how many streets there are, but I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> I know that you don't want to try to enumerate all of these streets. You have a few ideas of where you're going. And if there's a traffic jam on one of those streets or something is under construction, and again, not been here very long, you do have some streets under construction, <laughs> um, then you know how to reroute. You don't need to consider a million arcs. That's what this is doing. What this is doing is it's saying, you know what, there's only about a dozen um, of these paths that you're gonna be looking at to begin with. You really don't need many of these in order to try to solve the problem. So for the interdiction 101 type of setting, I would say these are the two different ways in general that we try to solve these problems. And uh, where it really becomes interesting though is when you start relaxing some of the assumptions that we've made here. There's lots of stuff to be done in this uh, realm. I'm not saying that the book is closed. This kind of formulation also helps you if your follower's problem is not a linear program. If it's an integer program, then you have to re you have to revise that structural constraint. That on so I would call that like an objective envelope constraint because that's what's going on here. You have to revise that constraint, but you can do it still, and it allows you to to solve those problems. The first formulation where you take the dual of the inner problem, well, if it's an integer program and it doesn't have a very nice uh, polyhedral structure, you're not taking the dual of it, and it's going to be too difficult. So this becomes much more attractive as a way to go. But yeah. then you need, still need to solve the shortest path on the full network, right? You do need to solve the shortest path on the full network, but again, that is so lightning fast that you can do that without formulating an integer pro or a, a linear program for that. And so you're able to do this using the order m plus log m type of uh, you know, algorithms. It's, it's super fast. You can, you can take advantage of those structures. Yeah, good point. You had questions? In your first formulation, uh, can't, why can't you employ a column generation? So if you employ column generation for something along these lines, let me go up over here. Where would I employ column generation? Oh, this. Ah, okay. 
Yeah, so, so what you could, uh, let's see, what you could do if you wanted to employ column generation, what you could do would be to ignore large areas of the network. So rather than uh, literal column, it would be kind of like this. You would ignore several <laughs> nodes in the network and then um, at the end, maybe solve a problem like this. In the same kind of thing in a branch and cut uh, type of scenario, I find a path, I think I have interdicted your path, I would run something else to say, did I get this right? And then you say, no, because I would have used this node over here. Why didn't you think of that? I would say, very subtly, yeah, I better put that node in the network, which would then force you to go ahead and um, add columns for the different pies that are missing. You would need to add rows for these as well. So it would mess with your column generation framework because you'd have to do rows and columns at the same time. You could do it, but that would be the, that would be the analogy of trying to just consider parts of the network at a time if you wanted to try. Okay, so there's a lot more that you can do, and um, this is you know there's what, what I've shown you would be the state of the art uh, as you know. 25 years ago, something along those lines. But maximum flow problems, any, I mean, I've, we, we just have the, when we talk about interdiction, it's like one of these phrases that if you're gonna say interdiction, your, your mouth just wants to say network interdiction. Like we always wanna say network You can interdict anything you want. So they don't have to take place on interdictions. We've done this with respect to scheduling problems or spreads, I know this is still networks, but spread of information on networks. Now actually, in my area, I'm, I uh, interface a lot with computer scientists because that's about 40% of the faculty in my college. It's a very popular area. And so they want to take a look at the way that information diffuses across a network and how you're going to limit that. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I can only say so much because, I'm, because of my role, but I'm like, that's a network interdiction call. But if I say that, then they're kind of forced to agree, so I try not to weigh too heavily on it. But it is definitely, you're seeing a lot of these types of problems come out. And I think that because of the math programming background that we have in this room, there's a lot of interesting problems that people are looking at right now that could really benefit from the type of analysis that we do. I'm gonna show you one over here before moving on because this is one of these problems that ideally I would, I would give this to you to work on and then I'd give you a little bit of a chance to look at it first. Um, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to spoil it for you. But this was one of these problems that I took from a website called The Riddler on uh, 538.com. They forgot. Once a week, they have these puzzles that um, they're supposed to be brain teasers, but I swear 80% of them are out of the OR, uh, the OR management science literature, and so I love them. But this one was something that uh, the, the thing is you have a, you're starting at the top, and you're trying to get to the bottom. And this blue is supposed to represent water. By the way, for me, this is the state of the art in computer graphics. This is something that I, that I did. Um, I have some figures later on in the presentation that are beautiful. Those are the ones that Dee Wynn did. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Wynn's very good at this stuff. I'm lousy. So I'll give you a quiz when we see some pictures. I'm going to ask you, did I make this or did Dee make this? And you're not going to have a hard time answering that question. Uh, this was mine. So coming from here to here, the catch is a storm comes in and it knocks out every bridge with probability of one half. So it's independent. And the question is, what's the probability that there's still a path from the green that's supposed to be land, from the green at the top to the green at the bottom? And so the problem is that you can have a lot of different kind of paths. You can start here, go left, down, over, up, over this way you really start to get all, it, 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 when you start breaking it down in terms of probabilities, it starts to get really ugly. So I <coughs> ignored my family for a, a weekday while I was playing with this, trying to find a, this is not quite that bad, but it was almost <coughs> that bad. Um, I was trying to find out the most elegant way of doing this. And um, what I ended up settling on was all of those horizontal uh, edges. If you look at all the combinations of those being up or down, then the problem decomposes and you can compute the cases uh, independently and it's not so bad. And I saw the answer and within see, after seeing the answer and messing with this problem for much longer than I'm going to admit on a recorded presentation, I immediately realized how I should have done it. 
and it's it, it it hurt first of all because I took too long with it and second of all because it was that realization of dude you should have known how to do this let me show you something kind of neat so that this is my citation for everything that I just <clears> said <throat> imagine that there's again that's my art because I stole it that's clip art right so imagine that you also have a pirate ship and pirate ships love treasure right this is this, this is exactly the pirate's reason for being. So the problem is the pirate can only get to the treasure if they can get past the bridge. The bridge, they can only, the pirate can only get past the bridge if it failed. Right? So if the storm wiped away the bridge, then you can use it. So every one of these intersections between your bridge and the pirate's lane, exactly one of them is going to be present. Does that make sense? So right over here, if this bridge failed, then the pirate can go from here to here. If the bridge did not fail, then the pirate can't go from there. So the pirate has a network formed by the null spaces of your network as well. That's actually, there's a, there's a term for that. I don't know if you've seen it or not. But from graph theory, that's called a topological dual. And you can use topological duals when you have planar networks. So if you're ever looking at network interdiction problems, and you start seeing things like we assume that the network is planar, and you wonder, what on earth does that get us? What it gets you is the ability to formulate a topological dual. If you can't remember the phrase topological dual, say pirate. Nobody in the literature will understand you, but I will. Okay? So you can just think of it that way. But this pirate network over here, if I can go to topological dual, what do you notice about the pirate's network and your network? Take the pirate's network and turn it on its head. Turn it 90 degrees. What do you see? It's exactly your network, isn't it? Now, the pirate's network is the same thing as your network, right? And if there is a if there's a path for you, what is that? These are rhetorical questions. Don't don't feel like you're being quizzed. Um, if the pirate has a path, then what does that mean for you? Don't you don't have a network. What if what if the pirate? What if you? Okay, which one did I just say? Yeah, if the pirate has a network. Or if the pirate has a path. You don't. If the pirate doesn't have a path, you do. So therefore, what's your probability of having a path? has to be the same, right? Your probability plus the pirate's probability has to equal to one, but you have the same network. So when I did all of, so it's gotta be one half, right? So as soon as I calculated all of those things and I tallied it up the bad way and it said one half, I thought, wait a minute. And then that's when I realized that I had completely screwed this up. By not going to one of the first papers in network interdiction by Wolmer in 1966, and this is how they solved the problem. And what they, this is for a max flow problem. It is a great paper. So I thought you might be entertained by this. I actually have some research to show you too, yes. But I thought you might be entertained by this because you go back through, there's this wealth of knowledge using different methods than what we would immediately rush to use right now. And they, and they have these really elegant ways of examining these problems. All right, so let me talk to you a little bit about some of the structure of the problems that I'm <coughs> interested in. So in the network interdiction problems that are out here these days, there's problems that may or may not actually be zero sum. And you can have some stochasticity in the network. And so there are things that are in between as well. And so what I'm interested in is something in between where there's asymmetry. Now, asymmetry normally means that the interdictor has the advantage. So this won't, so to make this consistent for us, I'm going to play the role of interdictor when we're describing these problems. And you'll be the people that are trying to, the, the operators, all right? So, just remember, anybody in administration like me is usually the bad guy. So when I'm destroying things, I'm, you know, the dean's the bad guy, right? So I usually have an advantage over this because the network belongs to me and I've got some sort of information on the network that I'm trying to control. But that's not always the case. So almost every paper, and in fact, I'm going to put yourself out there, but I think every paper in the literature is assumed that if there's asymmetry, it's because the leader has the advantage of information. But that need not always be true, and here's why. And the problem we're interested in, those base costs, those CIJs that we have before, those base costs are uncertain. And the reason why is that right now, I am going to try to, I, I, here's, the, here's the example I'm gonna give you. I'm going to try to interdict your, uh, the, the, the path you have to get home. So which roads do I wanna block? But I have to determine that right now at 11.30. Now, I don't know when you're going home. That's the problem. I don't know if you're going home at four o'clock this afternoon, at eight o'clock this afternoon, 
and with faculty in the room, to the students, I'm not asking you to tell anybody. You, you don't have to. We'll assume you're working late. But the, but the point is, if I don't know when you're going home, I can't know what your base costs are. Does that make sense? So if it's during rush hour, there are some paths that are going to be great. If it's not during rush hour, there are other paths that you would prefer. I don't know what they are. So I will know, I'm going to assume that I know the, the I don't know the base cost, but I do know the delays. There is no problem in doing that. The, to accommodate the case in which I don't know the delays either, it's just a, it's a straight transformation. So don't worry about that. That's just for simplicity. All right. So I only know the distributions of the art cost. And so here what I'll say is that the costs are non-negative because if the cost can be negative, then I have to worry about negative cost cycles. And uniform distributions, we did this. Uh, D and I made that assumption because it made the paper a heck of a lot easier to write because when I wanted to take the expected value, I could take the midpoint rather than having to do all of the different kind of um, uh, problems. We thought it was just for simplicity and exposition. Turns out it's not. Turns out that when we started looking at different distributions, it gets to be a lot uglier than we thought, and I'll show you why that is in a second. So I'm making most of the assumptions here without any loss of generality because it's easier to talk about. That assumption turns out not to be just for sake of presentation. That turns out to be for model tractability instead. So there's a, there's a lot more study that can be done here. So the way the game goes is that I interdict first, without knowing the base cost, and then you, before making your travel, you know exactly what the base costs are. If you decide to leave at 6.30 tonight, you know exactly where, I mean, within reason, you know exactly what the base costs are because you can take a look at your cell phone and see there's a traffic accident over here, this way is clear, we're perfectly fine. So now you have the advantage because you get to wait and then make a decision. So you also observe the interdiction action? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I have to commit the interdiction action I had to, uh, you know, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So you get all of that advantage. And then after doing this, you get to observe the Schwartz path. All right. Now, my problem is to maximize your, uh, your shortest path. That's the same thing as before, but now it becomes an expected shortest path problem. Because I, your problem, now you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, where's the uh, expectation in your problem? No, it's not the... It's not that you have an expectation, it's that I don't know when you're traveling. So it's the expected value of the shortest path cost that you will obtain, even though your shortest path cost will, when you're solving the problem, itself be deterministic. It's still an expected shortest path. Okay. Beautiful graph over here, very detailed. I'll show you exactly what it is. Did I do this one or did D do this one? <laughs> this was D, very good. So this is nice. So, there's a lot going on here. What you see on these arcs, and the reason that I wanted to show you is because it really kind of communicates what the problem is. So I'm gonna to talk to you about algorithms, but if I can at least communicate to you clearly what the problem is and why it's cool, then I've at least accomplished something. And this shows you why it's cool, why I think it's cool. So here, this is the base cost. It's somewhere between eight and 12. That's all I'm telling you, okay? Now, if it's interdicted, then that uh, extra delay goes up by, by one minute. Okay, so it's not, a, it's not a devastating action here, but it's enough to be able to communicate what we're doing. Uh, everywhere I've just got a number. I'm choosing this because I'm short and this is the only one I can reach. This zero over here just says it's a cost of zero no matter what. There's no uncertainty, and if you interdict it, nothing happens to it. It's, it's not interdicted. Okay, so really you've got three paths from my um, starting node of node one to my uh, ending node of node four. And that's a yellow path, a blue path, and a red path. Those are the only options that you have. So if I don't do any interdiction at all, and you just wanted to figure out what the expected uh, cost would be, you would say, well, this one has an expected cost of 10, and the blue one has an expected cost of 11, actually always has a cost of 11, and the yellow one has an expected cost of 12, so you would choose red. Now, depending on what these costs are on arc 1, 3 and arc 2, 4, this is the plot. This is the map of what happens, what you will decide to do based on where those costs actually are. Remember, you get to, deserve, you get to observe what those costs are. So if no arc is interdicted, we're over here, and that expected case of cost, uh, arc 1, 3 having a cost of 10 and arc 2, 4 having a cost of 12 is right here in the middle, and that's in that red region. So as long as my costs are anywhere in that two-dimensional space, anywhere in this 
quadrilateral, you're going to choose the red path. If I make the cost of arc 1, 3 really high, and I also make the cost of arc 2, 4 very high, then you end up in this blue rectangle which corresponds to saying, just take the, the, the path that has a cost of 11. You'll always just do that. Does that make sense, what's happening here? So anywhere if the costs are in this yellow region, you're taking the yellow path as well. So if I do no interdiction at all, what is your expected cost? Well, I have to integrate over the cost in this, in this rectangle. It's not a terrible integration. But it's actually not that easy either because you, you have these weird shapes over here. It's a pain. I thought it was easy. And I said, D, just figure out a nice closed form expression. And she said, I can't, you do it. And then I looked at it and I said, okay, you're right, I can't either. It's, it's fine in two dimensions. It's, it's not okay in multiple dimensions, it gets ugly. But we can still do this. So it turns out your average cost would be 8.77 over here. So of course you want to interdict something. So if I should interdict an arc, if I can interdict an arc, do I want to interdict arc 1-3? Or do I want to interdict arc 2, 4? So if I interdict arc 2, 4, that's what the map looks like. If I interdict arc 1, 3, that's what the map looks like. OK, real quick. What if we just took, this is what's on my next slide, by the way. But what if I just said, I don't like all of these pictures. Don't tell D. I don't like all these pictures. I don't want to do all of this. Just let's just take the average. And let's just interdict based on the average. So if I were to interdict based on the average cost, this would have a length of 10. And that one up here would have a length of 12, right? So then I would interdict arc 1, 3, because that would force your cost to be, on, uh, to be 11. Make sense? Because if I don't interdict it, you would have this option of 10. So I would definitely interdict arc 1, 3. But look at the average cost here. The average cost, if I interdict 2, 4, goes to 9.88. But if I interdict 1, 3, it only goes to 9.16. So it's interesting that if you just take the average cost and you interdict a deterministic model based on your average cost, it says do one thing. But if you do the problem where you say interdict the expectation of the, of the follower's cost, you do something different. So there is a little bit of subtlety going on with this. We thought this was, we thought this was pretty cool. And we didn't have to search very long for such an example. This, um, it turns out that these problems are markedly different, even though they seem the same. So, with, so it doesn't work out. Uh, the expected cost is not the same thing. The actual interdiction solution is not correct because of what I had just mentioned. And so we threw the idea away, and then we came running right back to it a couple days later. We said, wait a minute, that's still useful. This is still very useful. And I'll show you one. So there is a, a variation on this uh, called the conditional value at risk problem that I'm going to talk to you about later. But for now, I'm simply going to say that we're looking at the, uh, the, the expected value case. So once again, we're playing this game. I'm trying to maximize what I think your cost will be on average. So I act, and then we take all the different scenarios that could occur, meaning the base cost, and for every one of those scenarios, you're going to find the shortest path, and I'm taking the average over those. That's the problem we're trying to solve right now. Okay. So. We shamelessly stole this idea from, uh, from Kelly Cormican and David Morton and Kevin Wood. I, I, I never got a chance to meet uh, Kelly Cormican, but uh, Dave and Kevin really, they were some of the best mentors for me in my career. In the first few years that I started, they sat me down, talked to me about some of the stuff they were doing. They gave me problems to work on that were bite-sized problems that I could sink my teeth into so I could get into this and then really took me under their wing, even though they weren't uh, in my university. They were just supporting younger people in their field. So I want to give them credit for being phenomenal operations researchers, but they're, they're, they're pretty awesome people, too. I want to make sure that, that I say that. So as a way of thanking them, I stole their idea. Uh, so they um, cited their paper, and this is what you actually want, right? So what they did is they, they used Jensen's inequality. I'm going to show you what that is and how, um, how we used it. It's actually the first time you study Jensen's inequality, you're looking at like, wait, what's going on? It's really simple. If I've got a, this is a convex function. Will you believe me? This is a convex function. If I take the convex function and I take something that's anywhere on the chord above that, it's, it's greater than or equal to this. So you can really do this with any kind of problem. And then that makes it easier when you're talking about stochastic programs to get bounds. Now I've trivialized the derivation of it, but that's your intuition behind what's going on over here. Okay. So what am I talking about? 
So if you take a problem and it's a um, it's a it's it's the problem we're looking at the um, objective uh, the uncertainty is in the objective like what I just mentioned an objective function value then if you take the expected value problem that's like using this chord that's sitting on top of it then what you're looking at is an overestimation of what the actual stochastic programming bound would be so anytime you cheat and you just say give me the expected cost you're essentially drawing a chord on top of a convex function and so it's an upper bound if the uncertainty is in if the uncertainty is in the uh the constraints itself then it's the opposite it's the dual of that so you get a lower bound yeah i'm sorry go ahead is this tantamount to applying a fixed form uh, to so it, it is the only fixed, though I, I do want to be clear with one thing. The only fixed point that I did here was with the interdiction decision. Yeah. So the uncertainty, uh, so that is fixed. The part that's still variable is the shortest path that the follower can take. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll give a model in just a second to make that really clear. Thank yeah, th thanks for asking. So it's here. So to answer your question, what I've done is I fixed the interdiction X and then it's still, the, the stochastic program is still being solved with recourse over the path Y, but the fixedness that you're talking about is absolutely true, that the X part is fixed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so this is essentially the same principle that's using gate theory, is that? Okay. It, it, yeah, um, Not exactly. The most honest answer I can say is, I don't know, I gotta think about okay. that for a second, because I don't wanna say something and then realize that I misled you. I think, I think it's actually slightly different because what we're doing is we're trying to compute the, um, for a fixed X. Okay, here's the answer. So there are two different kinds of bounds you can get. One where you force the follower to actually commit their actions first, and that would be the game theoretic bound that you can get. And we didn't do that. But actually, it's funny that you mentioned that. In the Cormican paper, because they actually studied a different problem, that's how they got their other bound. So they got the first bound, this upper bound. They got by fixing X and then using Jensen's inequality to solve this to get an upper bound. But to get a lower bound, what they did is they actually swapped the order of play uh, because they forced the follower to go first, which then gave the, 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 the leader the more information. And so they were able to do it that way. So they used that game theoretic bound of fixing a point. I'm using the convexity of the objective function to get, to get a bound. I yeah, good, good question. Thank you. All right, so in doing so, note here that the, um, the uncertainty in the, is all in the objective function. And um, what I've done, the uncertainty is sitting here in this C. That's where, remember, it's the costs that are uncertain. So if I fix X and then I just let C be the average, um, the expected value of the data itself, and then I solve this problem, it is a very simple problem to solve. That is just the network interdiction problem. I mean, it's still NP hard, but folks, that, that solves really, really fast. Just, it solves super fast on this. So this is, well, with X fixed, it's no, it's, it's not. It's just the shortest path problem. It's not NP hard, it's just the shortest path problem. So I fixed X over here. Sorry, I forgot about that. So very, very uh, fast to solve that to get an upper bound. Now, what I'd love to do is I'd love to get a lower bound so I'm going to use Jensen's inequality again, but this time I'm going to reformulate the problem so the uncertainty is on the right-hand side. All right, be prepared to see the worst formulation for a shortest half problem you've ever seen. So this is absurd. Why would you ever do this? The only reason you would ever do this is because you're trying to use Jensen's inequality to get a lower bound on a stochastic program. So what we did, and don't worry about all this, what I'm really trying to do here is to say, you can reformulate this problem by saying, here are the lower bounds, and here's the extra part. So what's above? The Q is the cost above the lower bound. Forget about interdiction. It's just the cost above the lower bound. And so I'm using this by actually putting all of the uncertainty, putting these cost uncertainties on the right-hand side. So I, I, I can, with about three more minutes of explanation, convince you that this is legitimate or to keep you awake and to thank you for coming to my talk, I can simply say, folks, it's ugly, but it works. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. It's ugly, it works, it's fine. You can convince yourself pretty quickly. The point is, it gives me a lower bound. So, Jensen's inequality is saying, the part that you want, which is right here in the middle, you interpret that as, here's the expected objective function value that you're going for. It is less than or equal to that first formulation, it's greater than or equal to the second formulation. 
So like any good optimizer, what do I do? I take my data, take my problem, I put the expected value in the middle, and then I get my H down here, my G up here, and I just hold my breath and I really hope they're the same number, because if they do, I'm done. That's what we do, right? Solve an integer program, how do you do it? Solve a linear program and hope it comes out as integers. All right, we're doing the same thing. Okay. There's good news and bad news. The good news is, is eventually those bounds do meet uh, each other. And it's not an infinite uh, thing. Uh, these, you can, if you're careful with your algorithm, you don't need convergence in the limit. You get finite convergence. The bad news is that only happens if, within that region of uncertainty, there is one path that is always optimal. So, what that would mean is all of those uncertain solutions, those, those possibilities that are out there. Uh, so I make my interdiction. And no matter where we are in that region that I was showing you, it would always take the same path, no matter what the data outcome is. When that happens, the lower bound and the upper bound are the same. That's the only time they meet. Okay. If they, and it's if and only if, so that's even worse. But if you have multiple optima, what does it hold if, ah. if a single path is optimum in all those multiple optima? It, so I should say, so, so you got me. So the, um, the, the actual condition is, does there exist a path that is optimal for every data okay. outcome? Okay. So there could be multiple optima. Uh -huh. um, that doesn't come up very frequently, but it can, uh -huh. it certainly can. But it's not if there exists multiple optima, but if I got one path that is uniquely optimum over here, well, let me just say it this way. What, what I said the last time was right. If there exists a path that's optimal everywhere, then you're good, good. and stop. Okay. The bad news is that doesn't happen. <laughs> so uh, when that doesn't happen, then you get a gap. Um, it's, it's like a duality gap. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a direct kind of explanation that you get there. So what do you do in branch and bound? You end up branching. We're doing the same thing here, but we're not branching on decisions. We're branching on the actual data itself. So we'll take your region of uncertainty, which I've shown you as that two-dimensional rectangle before, and you're going to split it into cells. And, the re and by doing that, you end up allowing for one path to be optimal in this cell and another path to be optimal in this cell. And when you do this kind of spatial branch and bound, it allows you to get closer and closer to, to narrow these optimality gaps as you go. Now, what that ends up doing, we take these and we call them cells. So I've, I've called these cells because they're like these rectangles that I showed before. What I would tell you is keep in mind that for presentation, I'm showing you two dimensions. When you really have, when you have 10 arcs, you're talking about a 10 dimensional hyper rectangle or whatnot. And it just gets to be a little bit uglier. But your intuition is pretty solid on two dimensions. I would just say there's a few shortcuts we can make in two dimensions that we cannot do in multiple dimensions. And that, that, that's something we, we kind of ran up against a few times. But if you keep splitting into smaller and smaller cells, just like what we're doing over here, eventually what happens is when these cells get to be very small, there's one path that's optimal in this cell. There's maybe a different path that's optimal in this cell a different path that's optimal in this cell. And then maybe in this cell, there are still multiple paths, like one path is optimal over here and a different one's optimal over here. But now your, your uh, bound has gotten to be so small, and that's only one fourth of the area anyway, that you can start seeing that you're, you're within some sort of tolerance limit and you can stop. Again, there is a finite uh, convergence argument. Um, we're not going through that today. It's just it's a pain. But it is. Uh, but but if you're not careful, you don't get that finite convergence. If you are careful, then you do. But how do you choose the arc on which you're going to split the? Ah, oh, so I paid him twenty dollars to ask me that question. It's on the next. It's on the U.S. dollars at that. And it's on the next. It's on the next. Yeah. And my question was really like, how do you partition the space? Sorry, it's the last twenty bucks I had. <laughs> um, tell me it's on the next slide. Oh shoot! I'm sorry. It's coming. It's coming. It wasn't literally on the next slide, so I will I will I will talk about that because the the great thing is D and I were pretty careless on it because she said, well, what, what should we say? Well, it doesn't matter. I was wrong. <laughs> I was so wrong. Um, we went into a rabbit hole. We probably cost her three years of her life on that one. But um, the three months anyway. So how do you solve a problem like that? This is this g of x. That's the upper bound using Jensen's inequality. You actually use that uh, trick that I was mentioning before about the Bender's decomposition. 
and it, it lends itself, I had given it in the sense of a deterministic model, but it becomes even nicer when you're talking about a stochastic program, because now, for those of you in stochastic programming, as soon as you have multiple cells, you can think of those as multiple scenarios and a scenario decomposed stochastic program, where the size of the cell is the probability of receiving that data outcome. So you treat it exactly like you would treat a stochastic program with point data estimates, where the points are at the, the data point at the middle of each one of those cells. But because that point is at the middle of the cell, you're getting an upper bound on the expected cost within that cell. So this is an upper bounding model, but the more cells you have, or the smaller those cells get, the tighter that upper bound actually gets. And of course, we can approach it from both directions. So you solve this in order to recommend your interdiction action. You pick some tolerance parameters, and this gets a little bit, uh, yeah, this gets a little bit tedious. So I don't want to, I don't want to get lost in these details. But what you really have to do first is you have to figure out, am I missing some paths? Just the same way that when I showed you about a half hour ago how you would solve that problem by Bender's decomposition, you first have to make sure that you're capturing the follower's actual action. Because if you're not, you need to generate those rows. So I'm going to assume that you've gone through this and that you've added all of the paths that are necessary. So that's the first optimality condition, is that you've made sure that, you've satisfied, that the follower is doing what you think they would be doing. Okay? And then after I've done that, okay, I know what my follower would do, we agree on this. What about my gap in each one of those cells? Is it tight enough? So if, I, if, I, if it's close enough within tolerance parameters, great. I can terminate, I've got an optimal solution. If it's not within those uh, tolerances, that's when I need to branch and I need to come back to the questions that you're asking me over here. Okay. There's, a, there's several different tricks. And again, like I said, I'm, I can go down the the, um, what we call the rabbit hole of all of the different ways you can do this. There's some really nice tricks that can be done. There are some things that worked beautifully in theory that were awful in practice, and I'm skipping those. But the fastest way of doing this is actually to test all of your optimality conditions, optimality one conditions. That is, make sure that the follower is, before you even think about partitioning cells, which is really expensive, because every time you do that, you're creating more scenarios, and that can spin out of control very fast. Before you do that, make sure there's a need. So do your vendor's decomposition cuts first. Once you're at a point where you've executed all of your vendor's decomposition, then you go through and you, uh, you separate or you partition any cell for which the optimality gap is too large. For which you're okay. Now, what we did was to figure out, now I'm getting to the, the question of how you branch on an arc over here. The idea is that if I'm standing in a, so imagine that I'm surrounded by this rectangle over here, and I'm in the middle of it right now. If I can take a very, very short step to my right, and I'm all, this, all of a sudden going to use, so I've got one path that I'm going to use now, and I just very, very slightly move a little bit to my right, then it, and now I would take a different path then it means that my solution right now is very fragile. So if you think about robust optimization and you're looking for a path that's optimal everywhere, this is a very not robust solution. If I just tweak the cost data just a little bit and I come over here and I'm no longer optimal, that means that right where I am right now, there is a lot of the feasible, re a lot of this uncertainty region that is not going to give me an optimal solution where I'm currently standing. So remember, the cells that I'm concerned about are the ones where I've got multiple optimal solutions within the cell. Not alternative optimal solutions, but multiple unique optimal solutions. If it is a fragile point, what I'm referring to as a fragile point over here, that's where I really want to do my partition. The great news, the bad news is that requires me to do sensitivity analysis. But the good news is you get sensitivity analysis for free when you're doing straight dextrose algorithm. It's just sitting there with you in your pies, right? So we do sensitivity analysis to try to figure out where we are and how fragile our solution is. And then that allows us to uh, very quickly figure out how robust our solution is for change, to change. And then where we figure out where very, um, this, there's a measure that we give, a score solution that we give over here. Where we find out our most fragile solutions are, meaning if I take the length of my cell that I'm looking at, and I use that as my denominator, my numerator is how far do I have to go before I screw it up? That gives you a score. A smaller score means more fragile, means that's where you want to try to, to, um, to, to partition. 
So that's what we ended up doing. And the, the right way of solving these problems was using this multi-cut and multi-partition idea. The score enhancement helps. I had uh, some more uh, you know, tables and graphs and look how well our algorithm works. Yeah, it works fine. What I really wanted to show you was the intuition and the, and the thought process that we used behind all of this. We also had this idea of freezing cells. If I could find that with the current solution, that if I do the 100% rule for sensitivity analysis and I can determine that I would always be optimal within my cell, that I could freeze that cell, meaning I don't have to worry about partitioning it again. Turns out there's a much faster way of doing that. You can, you can solve at different corners of your, of your uncertainty region and that would, that would really work very well. Okay, so if there was time, I was going to present a little bit more on a uh, conditional value at risk. There's really not, I mean, it's almost noon over here and I, I, was, I was ready for that to happen. But what I, so I had, a, had it there just in case the, you know, we had enough time. What I did want to tell you, and I can tell you this in about a, uh, a minute without going through a whole bunch of slides is, let me just ask real quick, and I promise not to quiz you, okay? Do you, uh, how many of you are familiar with conditional value risk? Okay, so tell me, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just said, I just said it wouldn't. No, so the idea behind conditional value at risk is that you have, uh, what, what we've done here is I've said, I want to average over every possible outcome. If I'm paranoid and I'm really thinking, well, what if they get the absolute best case scenario? Another way of saying is, instead of over every possible outcome, I want to average over only the very worst outcomes. The very worst case scenario would be the one worst case outcome. By the way, that's really easy. You just take the, uh, the, the smallest possible travel times and pl plug that in as deterministic. Okay? So that's the easier case. If I want to do all of the data outcomes, then that's the paper that I just presented over here. Or I could have a parameter that's somewhere between 100% and 0 well, 0.01%, and I could say 20%. Tell me the worst 20% of the data outcomes and I'll average over those. And that's the conditional value at risk. The difficulty in doing conditional value at risk is that I cannot specify a priori where the worst 20% would be. For the worst 100%, I know exactly where that would be, it's all of them. For the worst single case, I know where that would be. That would be at that lower left-hand corner, if you wanna think about it that way. But for the worst 20%, that depends on the interdiction action itself. So the shape of the worst 20% is a function of my interdiction action. So that's another interesting type of problem. And I'll just say we've, we've worked on that as an outreach of that study. I would simply say that the biggest unproblem, uh, unsolved problem that we've had over here, I mentioned this before. I said we use these um, uniform probability distributions what breaks with the uniform probability distribution? Those upper bounding models, Jensen's inequality and the lower upper bounding models, and saying I'll just put something in the middle, my point in the middle, and that'll be the expected value. Not e if it's, even if it's a normally distributed cost, something that's, but you know what, make it even. Make it a triangle distribution. As soon as you start partitioning, and you've got those beautiful symmetric triangle distributions, they're no longer beautiful symmetric di distributions anymore. It all falls apart. We were really surprised how quickly that fell apart. So that's good for, for Dr. Wynn. She's just got her uh, PhD. She's got a career long of research. It's even better for me because that problem looks really hard and I don't have to do it. So she can work on it. <laughs> so with that, let me thank you for your attention. Let me also make sure to thank you one more time very sincerely. It's an honor to be here. I greatly appreciate your, your, your um, uh, I don't know, your, your thinking of me and inviting me up here, and um, I, I very much enjoyed myself. It was very considerate of you to have me up here, so I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. If you have any questions. Go, go for it. Okay, so uh, in general, like CVAR is a very popular risk measure that is being used in interdiction because it reduces to a linear program. And I mean, now, on the contrary, you are saying that, okay, the problem is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, is it because that your algorithm uses certain structure in the problem that you cannot exploit with CVAR? Or is it the case that this problem is in general difficult? So the, the, the question is, look, if it got difficult by using CVAR, what happened? Because, and again, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but what you said is, is really a, a great question. 
if you, de if you decide to use value at risk, and I'm going to take one step back and then I'm going to answer your question. So value at risk, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, say that I've got uniform cost somewhere between, like the objective is going to be somewhere between 10 and 20. All right, so 10 on this side and 20 on this side. So the worst, I'm doing this right? Yeah, okay. So uh, 10 on this side and 20 on this side. So if I wanted to say the conditional value at risk, the 20% worse, those would be the cost from my perspective of any, anywhere between 10 and 12, right? So the average would be 11. If I wanted to do value at risk, it would be the 20th percentile cost. So it would be a 12. That problem is really hard because you have to, um, you have to put in these really awkward constraints and they typically require extra binary variables. So you've gone from, with using value at risk, you run, the, you run the risk, sorry. You run the risk of taking an easy problem and making it hard, whereas CVAR doesn't do that. CVAR tends to say if your problem was easy before, I kept it easy. If it's hard, don't work. It's still as hard as it was. That's where we are. It was already hard. Network interdiction is already hard. So I haven't made it too much harder in terms of the worst case uh, scenarios. But the problem is that you still have to do this stochasticity. So it's not going to be worse than doing a stochastic program like what you would normally do. I haven't added any additional binary variables. But I, I still have to figure out how I'm going to handle the, um, the kinds of uncertainties like what I, what I showed over here. The good news in using CVAR is that all those cells where I had the lower bounds and the upper bounds and there was a gap, there's an extra step, and I'm oversimplifying what happens, but there's an extra step. It is, did I get the follower's reaction? Okay. Is there a gap? And if there's a gap here, I needed to reduce it. With the CVAR case, it's, is there a gap? Yes. Do you care? Because the answer might be, yeah, there's a gap, but I don't care. I know what the lower bound is, and that's not a part of my value at risk. And so that makes this actually more fun. Yes. First, thank you so much for your presentation. I have a basic question. Yeah. Uh, so, if you consider that we have an intelligent attack, your intelligent leader and follower, it would yeah. be a game. game right. So, we can consider the game theory. Right. So, I'm I just curious what would be different if we consider the approach to a game theory with this one? It would be the same result. You got. What would be the difference? Okay, so the biggest difference, let's take the stochasticity out of it, and let's just say that we agree on the cost, we agree on the interdiction. Um, and I'll be the bad guy again. I am, uh, my solution, there's no longer a, in general, there's no longer a pure Nash equilibrium solution. Meaning that I am not going to be able to give you a, uh, a strategy that I would use 100% of the time. Because if I give you a strategy and say, I'm going to interdict these arcs, what would you do? You'd say, I would give this path. I'd say, oh, well, then I would give these arcs. And then you say, no, well, then I would do this path. We go around in a circle like this. So with the Nash equilibrium, we get to a point where you see my solution, I see your solution. There's no longer any incentive for me to change, and there's no longer any incentive for you to change. So what we would do is we would have a mixed strategy instead. I would say, okay, I'm going to interdict this combination of arcs 30% of the time, and this combination of arcs 20% of the time, and this, sorry, just saying, and this combination of arcs 50% of the time. And then you would see that as a mixed strategy and you would have a random set of paths that you would, um, that you would uh, choose as well. And actually, that was Dee's last problem for her dissertation was, let's say that we can interdict some arcs now, and then we play a simultaneous game later where I monitor so certain arcs, but I do it randomly and you're choosing a path at the same time. So it's a combination of a problem where there's a leader action that takes place ahead of time, and then there is a simultaneous game with the Nash equilibrium that occurs after that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have a general question about asymmetric uh, network interdiction problems and stochastic yeah. network interdiction problem. Because as I understand, you define like some scenarios. So I yes. just want to know what is the difference when we say like asymmetric network interdiction or stochastic network interdiction. So asymmetric, so that's a, that's a great question. So for, for those on um, uh, uh, wherever, the YouTube, YouTube, Zoom, whatever this is. Uh, the, uh, for, for those online, the um, question is about uh, asymmetric versus stochastic, because I did both here. So what was the difference? So first, um, first, of course, stochastic, meaning that we don't, that there's some sort of randomness going on. 
an asymmetry meaning that one agent has an information advantage over the other. And typically where the asymmetry is, is not necessarily, there's not necessarily any stochasticity that goes on. But the asymmetry normally benefits the person who goes first because we're solving from the leader's perspective. Anytime you're solving this problem, you're optimizing what the leader is doing, anticipating what the follower is doing. Okay? So I know you're optimizing both, but you're really trying to craft a solution for the leader. So it doesn't make sense if you're trying to craft a solution for the leader to assume that the leader has the wrong information because if you knew the right information, then why are you doing it? So the leader, with, with most of the time, what you're talking about with asymmetry is, I know the information, I know that my followers have the wrong information, and I'm going to try to exploit the fact that you have the wrong information. So it's a very strong assumption. I'm assuming that my information is right, I'm assuming that your information is wrong, and I'm assuming that I know what your wrong information is. So essentially what I'm saying is, this travel time is 12 units, but you all think it's 15 units, and I know you think it is precisely 15 units. How would I then interdict in order to induce you to make the decision based on your wrong information that'll cause you to really get a nasty surprise? That's what I would try to do. It's not always unrealistic, but there are limited scenarios in which I think you can make that kind of strong assumption. What we did here is we did the opposite, where it is, um, I have limited information, but you have more information. But then that begs the question, how is it that I would have less information than you? And the only, I don't want to say the only, okay, this is true. The only situation in which I can think of it, limited by my own intellect, would be that it must be that you have not more information about the network, but that there's a timing gap where I have to make my decision now, which roads am I going to close? And you get to make your decision later, benefiting from knowledge. So really, when I make my decision, we have the same information, but when I make my decision, but you get to make perfect information-based uh, decision later. The only way, though, that that makes sense is if I incorporate asymmetry and stochasticity at the same time. So if asymmetry benefits me, I can make an argument that it doesn't have to be a stochastic program. If asymmetry benefits the follower with more information, then I would have to ask, why do they have more information? And it's, well, probably because they got to wait long enough to see the outcome of random variables, which means that I would therefore be solving a stochastic problem. There are probably other combinations I'm just not smart enough to think of. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm thinking actually backwards now. Okay. But I want to go I want to put my understanding to it. I think it was a plot to all the to the game of chess where the outcome was a finite outcome. So we essentially you know the distance, you know the and the outcome. Would it be possible to do the reverse problem that induce uh, the costs? And is that am I thinking about this in the correct manner? Yeah, and this is the follow-up part. This is the, the general question that actually has, has been nagging me for almost an hour. But I, I, I'm going to ask it now. Uh, I know that feasibility is, is a different issue. But in theory, how generalizable is this methodology to the general topology? Are there specific constraints that we have to put on the Lebesgue measure? Or is it simply enough to require that the space be housed off? Is, is there anything else that's required to apply? So, let, let, so I'll, I'll answer both of those, but let me clarify the last question. When you're talking about the topology, how general, are you talking about the uncertainty region itself or are you talking about my network? I'm speaking about the network. Okay, the network can be anything that you want. Now I drew, uh, early on I drew planar graphs and I was just doing that so I could illustrate what would happen with respect to, um, with respect to topological duels and being able to take a duel. Um, you don't necessarily need that. Well, so the method that I gave does not assume that. I would not claim, though, that it's impossible, that therefore you don't need something. So if I gave you a planar network, is there a better way of solving the problem? And I don't know the answer to that. There may well be, and I just haven't really given it a lot of thought. It really helps, though, with maximum flow interdiction problems. Now, with shortest path, I'm not sure. But with max flow, in a, um, in a topological duel, if you have a planar network, you get an advantage of structure because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to find minimum cuts. 
So that pirate ship that I was talking about, you can think of it as trying to navigate through minimum cuts. So that it really helps for that. I don't know if it would help you on a shortest path problem or not. I haven't been able to see it myself, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean anything. It just means I haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, so to answer that second question, you can have any kind of network you want. You can have a multi-network. You, um, you can have a hypergraph if you wanted to have a hypergraph. Um, you'd have to change the definition of the problem that you're looking at. But those graphs are very, very uh, general. And it turns out that even, doesn't matter if we're talking about a shortest path problem, we could generalize for the most part what we're talking about here to pretty much anything that has a network structure that we're looking at. The first question was, oh shoot, Inducing costs using Thank you. Here. Yes. <laughs> um, because I, I, I actually really, really like that problem. So there's a, um, a paper by Ravi Ahuja about 20 years ago that was inverse network optimization. So forget about the whole interdiction uh, bit over here. But it was the first time that I considered that problem myself, and I wanted to get into it, and I, ne I just never got a chance to because it's a very deep area, and I was going to have to spend a lot of time doing it. There's another set of researchers, um, one of them, Oleg Prokopiev, and the other, Juan Barrero at Oklahoma State. Prokopiev is at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And they were looking at network interdiction problems where the, there's a lot of uncertainty in the topology itself. So we're playing this game, but as we're playing this game, I don't even know what your network looks like. I only see a few, a few uh, edges to begin with. So what I end up doing is I, I attack, and then you show me some paths and some areas of the network that I've never even seen before. And so we play this game where I'm trying to learn not only what your costs are, but what your network is. So I have to learn in a repeated game. So we, it's, what I'm showing you here is a one-shot game. But if we are playing this game repeatedly, I could start to learn what your costs are by the actions that you, that you make over there. So their work is where I think the state of the art is on, on that kind of problem. I ran across their paper because I was interested in a different kind of dynamic game where you take a, you take a, a, a decision. You don't take your entire path. You go one arc, and then I'm going to interdict some stuff. And then you take another arc, and then I'm going to interdict some stuff. And I'm still only uh, allowed to interdict, say, three arcs total throughout the entire game. That's a much harder game. It's much more like a game of chess because I can't encode this as a math program. It's not a two-stage game. It's a multi-stage game. But the beautiful thing about that is those problems are so fundamentally different. It is possible for an optimal, a unique optimal solution for me to interdict no arcs at any time. I simply sit there with the threat of attacking you to keep you on a path that I want you to keep on. And it's, it's, it's a much different game. So the field is wide open. There's a lot of cool stuff that's, that's out there. I hope, though, I, I talked too much. I hope I answered what you're asking. Yes, so I, I should look up Oleg's at Oklahoma State. Yep, uh, so Oleg's at uh, Pittsburgh, and Juan Barrero is the fellow at Oklahoma State. And they had this repeated game problem. So they called it a dynamic game, and I use dynamic differently. But I, I, I love their paper because they were looking at what happens if you play the game over and over again. And you start learning not only the cost but the topology, and then you infer what those costs are. And if you send me, a, if if you can't find it, just send me a note, and I'll I'll be glad to. Of course, a great composer, it will be difficult. There's not, yeah, that's right. So if you do Prokopiev and OR, oh, you get one person. If you do Prokopiev and Proposer, probably didn't it do it. Ukrainian, isn't he? Yeah. I think yes, yes. Oleg is. There are series of papers called Sequential Shortest Path Interdiction. You will find. It. Thank you very much. Worst case is that you find uh, some composers as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad case. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. So there's a related problem to shortest path, which is the network uh, equilibrium, right? Where right. you have a bunch of people, and they're all trying to get their shortest path to, from different points to different points, mm -hmm. and you have congestion. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about this problem of uh, the problem that uh, a leader has of interdicting a network in such a way to interdict the whole mobility system of the city, for instance. Oh, I, I think that's a great problem. I, I've thought about it. I haven't done anything with that. Uh, those network e those uh, problems with network equilibrium constraints, before you even start to interdict those, uh -huh. become pretty, pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, a 
of course, I know that you had uh, Anna Nagurney. I think she gave a talk uh, virtually, and so she is the she is definitely the person to ask on that. But some of the related work, if you want to think about it from an interdiction perspective, would be toll pricing models, because once you um, once you use instead of travel time, if you use a mix of travel time and cost as somebody's utility function, then you can actually impact not. By con you can control. I don't. I don't. I don't mean that literally, but you can exert influence on how those work. And so sometimes you do it with the objective of easing traffic. Sometimes you do it with the objective of maximizing revenue. Uh -huh. But that's. I think you would use the same principles if you wanted to interdict, because those are all non-zero sum games. Uh -huh because those are equilibrium constrained problems. Those aren't uh, the, the two-stage game where I control the tolls and then the equilibrium sorts itself out is not gonna be a zero-sum game. So therefore, you don't gain or lose any structure or penalty by saying, I'm trying to make it as good as possible or bad as possible, I'm trying to get as rich as possible. Uh -huh. Most of the times when we're doing toll optimization, we're not trying to make things bad, we're trying to use them for good. But if you're an adversary, then you're trying to do the other one. Okay, I think there's food to be had, and uh, I'm happy to keep talking with you, but, uh, but I, I respect your hunger as well. So thank you once again. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating, and also thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for accepting our invitation yeah, and your great presentation. And on oh. behalf of Morse, I'd be happy to give you this as a reminder. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate that. It's so kind of you. Thank you so much. You're really welcome. Oh, thank you again. Yeah. So we would like to celebrate the sixth anniversary of Morse with all of you, and then we will have a lunch and networking event. Uh, should I stop the sharing? Yeah, thank you so much. First, I would like to thank you for the great presentation and for your survey article. They really oh, helped me to convince good. the reviewers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that this has not been done. And especially if the survey is recent. Wow. Yeah, that's right, because we just had one with Yongjong. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah.